What's up, YouTubers and plant lovers? It's Justin, and today I was gonna show you how I care for my Gold Dust Croton. Now, the scientific name is Codium variegatum, but this is the Gold Dust Croton. I've also heard it called the Sunspot Croton as well, but I call it the Gold Dust Croton, and I have it in my bonsai form. Now, I must confess that I did not grow this tree from start. I did get it offline, uh, but I did not do all this great braiding with all this kind of fabulous ramification up here at the top. Though, I am responsible for keeping it alive for a couple of years, so I will go ahead and take full credit. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, congratulations down in the comments, because that goes a long way. <laughs> but uh, I do want to tell you how I care for it, and I am going to go ahead and transplant it. Uh, he did get knocked over the other day, and I don't know if you can tell, but he's all crooked. He almost broke his pot, lost a lot of soil. Um, and did a little bit of damage to him, broke some branches. Uh, so I want to go ahead and clean him up and give him a new home. I do realize that it is the last day of summer and it's not ideal to go ahead and transplant uh, bonsai trees, you know, right before the fall or the first day of fall anyway. Uh, typically, you want to kind of do that in the spring, depending on the plant. Uh, but this is a tropical plant and it does hail from these, uh, from southeastern Asia and kind of like the Western Pacific Islands. So it comes from an area that gets a lot of tropical and kind of subtropical weather. Ideally, <laughs> temperatures are in a perfect world around 60 to 85. There's a lot of humidity, a decent amount of sunlight, an okay amount of rain. Uh, pretty much ideal conditions to keep this guy thriving. And that's not really the ideal conditions that we receive here in Kentucky. Uh, but in order to keep one of these guys alive, you kind of really want to go ahead and meet those conditions as best as possible to keep them alive, happy, and thriving. Now, I will tell you that these are kind of understory plants, mostly kind of like shrubs. Indoors, they kind of top out around two feet. Um, in greenhouses, they can get a little bit taller. Uh, in nature, they get considerably taller, but uh, I don't think that most of them really top out around two feet. Uh, they get to about that height, uh, so he's not going to be a huge plant, but uh, he won't be a huge tree that ends up topping out on all the others and getting a lot of sunlight. So uh, with the sunlight conditions for this guy, it's usually kind of bright indirect sunlight, something that's filtered, something that's dappled. I have him sitting outside and I have him kind of nestled under some taller trees. So he does get bright morning sunlight. And after about one or two, the sunlight kind of moves away and he's in shade for about the remainder of the day. So anywhere from about six to seven, maybe eight hours of kind of filtered bright light on a good day. Uh, and then after that, it's just shade for the rest of the day. And that seems to make him happy. Uh, I will tell you that these leaves are easily scorched. So if you have this guy sitting in a bright southern facing exposure, or if you have it outside and there's no protection at all, you will lose the leaves quickly. Now, typically with a lot of bonsai trees and a lot of trees and shrubs in general, <clears throat> they can lose that first round of leaves and then sprout a second layer and all will be fine. Uh, but you gotta be careful and really know what you're doing and how to bring those leaves back. You can't really just kind of leave it to its own devices and hope that it will. Uh, it does kind of have to be nurtured a little bit and then moved around so it's not getting bright sunlight again. But basically, you just kind of want to develop its cuticle. Now the cuticle is the layer that's over top of the leaves and most of the plant that's kind of a protective coat uh, and basically that kind of helps with the sunlight and once you develop the cuticle it'll be able to take brighter light for longer periods of time. Now, if you're not sure if your plant has a, de a developed cuticle then you want to err on the side of caution and introduce it to sunlight slowly. Ideally, if you go to a big box store and you find a plant you love and you bring it home, you're not sure if that pl plant has seen daylight in days, months, or years. So always err on the side of caution and don't introduce it into the place you're going to put it 
all of a sudden. You wanna do that kind of slowly. Uh, you know, for the first day, give it about 20 or 30 minutes of direct sunlight, and not too direct either, because that can even go ahead and scorch the plant out and leave sunburns and kind of irreparable damage that may not be able to be fixed. Uh, then after that, scoot it back for a little bit. The next day, a little bit longer, scoot it back. And then the third day, fourth day, you just kind of want to go up in about 10 to 20 minute increments each time. Ideally though, you do want to keep an eye on them. I'm not saying that that is a foolproof plan that won't cause your leaves to scorch, but for the most part, you just want to kind of introduce them slowly each day and go up a little bit more each time and then kind of scoot them back uh, with the sunlight. That will help it develop a cuticle. And then by the end of the week, you'll be able to give it longer periods of sunlight, more direct sunlight. So I do have mine underneath some taller plants and he does get very bright shade, kind of filtered indirect sunlight. Uh, but there is some direct sunlight that goes in there for anywhere from like two to three hours. And once he's been established in that area for quite some time, he's able to take more sunlight and the cuticles developed and he's good. Now, <laughs> with water, you gotta be careful with these guys too. <clears throat> they are from the tropics. So typically they're getting a decent amount of water, but I don't let the soil of mine dry out completely. I guess I should kind of rephrase that. Uh, typically you wanna water your crotons when they get about dry to about the top first inch or so. After that, you can go ahead and give them a little bit more water. The trick with crotons is to water them thoroughly yet infrequently. So you do kind of want to let them dry out almost completely before watering them again. And then once you do water, you want it to be very deep and very thorough and make sure that water is trickling out the drainage hole for a little bit. That ensures that water is going through the entire pot and hitting all the roots down in there. Roots that are left to be dry for a considerable amount of time, say a month, will start to dry out completely. And if it's not taken care of, those roots will start to die. And then the more roots that start to die, the uh, greater havoc you're wreaking on your plant. Uh, and if left unchecked, it could potentially kill your plant. So if you're constantly just going through and giving it a little spritz and maybe enough water's kind of trickling down about halfway through the pot, all the roots down here are gonna remain dry. And that's not an ideal watering condition for a tropical plant. And your plant will probably die if left unchecked. So just make sure that whenever you do give them water, it's pretty deep and a little infrequently. But again, watering, there's a whole bunch of factors that need to be considered before you go ahead and water your plant. Like I said, if you can stick your finger down in the soil and it's dry down to about the first, maybe the second knuckle, then you can go ahead and water it again. Typically, your crotons do tell you a little bit if they need some water. You'll see the leaves kind of sag a little bit and look kind of unsightly and they just look thirsty. And uh, at that point, it's pretty much done some damage to your plant. So you don't want it to always get to that point before you start watering. Uh, but you do kind of want to pay attention because they will tell you if they are thirsty. But if they're left in bright, direct sunlight, if it's in a windy location, if the temperature is exceeding 85 degrees for a long time, what kind of pot you have it in, all of these factors need to be considered whenever you're deciding how much water to give your plant. But like I said, you can always kind of pick your plant up and tell if it has water in there or if it seems heavy or if it seems light. And typically with most of my plants, I will kind of lift them up a little bit to kind of see, or I'll just kind of stick my finger in there. Uh, because with crotons, an infrequent watering schedule does a lot of damage to these plants. So as long as you're giving them the right amount of water consistently, they're pretty happy plants. They do love their humidity as well. So make sure you're paying attention to that humidity level uh, because in their native home range, they always have a decent amount of humidity around them. Here, I always try to keep the humidity levels at around 45 to 50, on up to 60 sometimes, depending on the temperature. But you do want to keep your humidity range, especially indoors, you really shouldn't have your bonsai trees indoors for a long period of time. But if you do, make sure you're keeping that humidity level in check too. You can buy those humidity monitoring levels at Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart. And for like 10 or 11 bucks, it'll tell you the humidity range and the temperature range of that plant room that you're wanting to monitor. It won't tell you the whole entire house, uh, but you can get better ones that will kind of broaden the range. But most of them will just tell you for a room what the temperature is and what the humidity level is for that room. So always make sure you're watching the temperature because 
Conditions for these guys are around 60 to 85. Once temperatures get below 60, it does kind of start to have a problem with your crotons as well. They don't like it to be too cold and they will not survive a frost. Somewhat established plants may be able to take a light freeze for a little bit, but crotons do not like extremely cold weather and especially ones that change all of a sudden. So if it's hot one day and the next it gets pretty cold, you can see your leaves really kind of start to mess up and look unsightly. And then if temperatures get over 85 for a long period of time, that can really have a problem with your plant too. Once temperatures top out around 85 to 90 degrees, your plant stops photosynthesizing. And that's something you need to know because if you're watering it all the time, then it's not photosynthesizing and it's not able to use all that water when it photosynthesizes, and a lot of that will remain in the pot. And if left unchecked or you continue to water it, then your plant will actually succumb to root rot or just drown. So just remember, once temperatures top out over 85 to 90 degrees and higher, your plant's not photosynthesizing anymore. You still wanna do give it some water, but you don't wanna give it a ton. And ideally, if temperatures are considerably above 85 to 90 every day, you can water your plant about once a day, but just don't go haywire and water it an excessive amount uh, because it's not gonna need a ton but it will need some. Next, I wanna talk about their soil. They do have a little bit of a special need with their soil. They don't like soil that's very hard, clay, compacted soil. So you want something that doesn't compact very, doesn't compact very well, something that's kind of light and airy. Like I said, they're getting a bunch of rain and a bunch of water in their environment, so they don't need something that holds on to water all day long. They like the water, but they don't like to be standing in saturated soils all day. So always make sure that your soil is something that's not gonna hold on to excessive water for extended periods of time. I used to make my own. It was about three parts of a reputable garden soil that I liked, typically miracle Grow or Fox Farm, and then about uh, a handful of sphagnum moss. Uh, I would kind of mix that in really well. And then about two parts of some cocoa coir or some kind of fine pine bark mix. Either one of those kind of mixed in with it and then one to two parts of either perlite or horticultural grade sand is a great recipe for your crotons. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and transplant this guy into a new one. And like I said, I always use my Tiny Roots Premium Bonsai Blend Soil. And this stuff, I don't wanna do a commercial for them, but this stuff is amazing. I love this Bonsai Soil so much and I've used it for a decent amount of time now and I've had great results with it. This is a not a sponsored video, but I tell you, I love this stuff right here. And if you're transplanting any of your bonsai trees and you can afford to go ahead and buy this stuff, it really does work. And remember, you get what you pay for when it comes to the media of your soil. And then don't forget the soil pH for your uh, Go Dust Croton needs to be acidic to neutral. They like it anywhere from about 5.0 on up to 7.5 with the pH levels for this tree. The only other thing I wanna talk about uh, is kind of a two parts. One, this tree is toxic to birds, to dogs, to cats, and to people. So if you do have little ones running around, fur babies or real babies, be careful with this tree if you have one. Any of the croton species, they are toxic, so don't let any of your pets or any of your children come in and chew on any part of this plant because it's not good. Um, and then pest, they do have a problem with spider mites, mealybugs, and scale. And then disease, the only one that I really know that this plant has ever had a problem with is uh, root rot, so you gotta be careful with that. Now, I don't wanna jump up considerably high with the pot size just because I like to keep him in the shorter kind of traditional look for this bonsai tree. So I'm not gonna jump up too large in the pot size, but you will notice this is a cash pot. So I did go ahead and drill straight through the bottom. And I don't know what Walmart is doing with their pots, but a lot of these are really cool, but it's almost impossible to kind of drill through these anymore. It's, I don't know if they've got like a metal plate down through the bottom, <laughs> but I had to, this is like the second pot that I had to grab because the first one I got from there I couldn't actually drill through it and it looked like it was some kind of ceramic clay part and then this one too i could probably shatter it but i couldn't drill through it it took forever for me and cameraman to go ahead and get that out drill out that tiny little 5 16 hole or whatever size it was but i did go ahead and water him some and i do have my trusty mat underneath me so that i can go ahead and get him out of his pot now 
I know you can't see too well, but all I'm doing, typically I would grab the plant by its pot and kind of squeeze it a little bit so that I can make sure I can loosen the root mass. I can't do that with this guy because he's in such a hard pot. So I'm going to take my isopropyl alcohol and sanitize my chopstick and any other tools that may potentially come into contact with any part of the plant, i.e. pruning shears and my root rake here. Now, this is one of the most versatile tools out there for a bonsai master. But basically, you just kind of want to shove it down in here ever so gently as I'm trying to loosen this root mass up. I'm not trying to destroy the roots. Just want to kind of get this down in here to loosen this up around the wall of the pot. He's been in here for at least two, maybe three years now. And a lot of these roots will kind of <clears throat> attach to the wall. So just be gentle. Don't kind of shove him in there to rip everything. Just and try and loosen some of this up. You do a bunch of damage to the roots and you can cause a lot of problems to your brand new or your beautiful tree here. So take your time. If you feel any resistance at all, don't keep going. Pull back up and then lightly kind of tamp around there. All right, now that helps tremendously. So I'm gonna keep pulling slightly, tip him over knock out all this soil and then lightly kind of just wiggling back and forth and then I've got some resistance so I'm just gonna take my time and use my chopstick to kind of get in here and loosen him up and potentially knock out some of the soil that will create room here. And if you need to use gravity kind of help you out. I'll knock out a bunch of this media here to help free up some space. Now the reason why I say this is one of the most versatile tools out there is you can do a lot with the soil and the roots that you wouldn't be able to do with your fingers or any other tool. A lot of those other tools that I try to use end up being sharp and I would go ahead and slice all these roots up and puncture them and all that stuff. Now I'm not saying I don't do that at all with this one, but uh, it does have a blunt tip so I'm able to kind of be easier with the roots than I would be with something that's a little bit more tapered, a little bit more sharp inadvertently. But I can tell with the chopstick that the roots at the bottom are in there pretty good. So I just really want to take my time. I'm in no hurry. Just kind of loosen that up. Make sure it's all separated from the sides here. Leaving as much of the roots intact as possible. As opposed to maybe a butter knife or a pencil, a mechanical pencil of some sort that I've tried to use in the past. There's no way I'd be able to get any of my fingers down here at all. Just keep kind of wiggling back and forth. All right, almost there. there we go. There we go. Now, this one is taller, but this one's wider. And as you can tell, these roots, I'm gonna kind of look him over really well and kind of inspect as many of the roots as I can tell. But they all look pretty uniform. 
you just kind of want to go over the root base. Now, if I wanted to, I could use my chopstick to do this with the roots. It's a perfect tool for that. Or I can use my root rake here to kind of make faster work of it here. As I always say, you just want to lightly do this. You're not ripping through it. You're just gently combing and knocking off debris and that will free up individual roots here. Now, if you were to kind of slam it in there and rip, you would do a bunch of damage, obviously, to this tree's roots. Now, all I'm trying to do here is just free up some mass because I'm putting them in either a pot that's not much bigger, or even if I was gonna put him back in the same pot, you just want to trim the roots back so that he'll have ample room to kind of grow the roots out again. If you were to put all this back in the same pot without removing much of the media or even the roots, then all these roots would just kind of encircle the pot and kind of choke itself out. So it's good to get in here and free a bunch of this mass and media up so that the roots can come in and do their own root thing just lightly combing it back here, kind of going up on the roots and then down on the roots in some spots as well. Just trying to free up some of this debris, a lot of these roots here too. Just kind of lightly combing and being careful when you get to the top, you don't want to accidentally damage a branch or a stem. Like I said, while you're doing this, you really want to look at your tree and your root mass over. Look at the stem, look at the branches, all that beautiful ramification, both on the top and the bottom is perfect. I love it. And ideally, you're just really wanting to kind of zoom in on the roots and you want to look for any discoloration, anything that may indicate rot, different colors, discoloration typically black something that maybe kind of smells rotted or just has a smell to it will typically indicate rot and then any kind of roots that aren't uniform like I just said or roots that are extremely mushy because that oftentimes indicates root rot so you want to keep an eye on that just to make sure that your watering schedule is doing more good than harm. All right. And then now I will kind of take over with the chopstick just to kind of knock more out of the way. And I'm trying to free out a bunch of these weeds too. There's a lot of clover down here. Remember, it may look kind of cool for there to be some plants growing in here with your bonsai tree, but just remember everything that it's growing in there with it needs nutrients and water that ends up stealing away from your tree. So you can give your plant a little friend or your tree a little plant friend, but if you have too many of them in there growing with them, it's gonna take away valuable nutrients and water that your bonsai tree needs in order to thrive and grow and look good. Alright, before I take off too much more, I want to go ahead and come in here and trim out all these roots just to see where his mass is standing. You don't want to take off too much. Ideally, anywhere from 25 on up to 40% is okay. And then if you are doing a bunch of trimming below the soil and above the soil, make sure you do that in separate parts. You don't really want to stress your tree out by taking off 30% of the root mass and then 30 to 40% of its crown too. So I'm not going to be doing any pruning in the crown today. So I can afford to take off just a little bit more around the root mass than I normally would. Take your time, especially when you have these sharp pruning shears in your hand. 
that are covered in soil you don't want to accidentally nick a branch or a stem perfect I think that should be okay now I will go ahead and set him in his oat pot temporarily while I go ahead and get the new home all set up and ready go just about a quarter of the pot just enough to give him something to sit on and he does like some acidity so I'm going to sprinkle in just a little pinch of some cocoa core here and then I'm going to mix it in with the bonsai soil put just another little three fingered pinch there just to kind of, you can't even really even see it but it's there alright, now I will take him out Knock off just a little bit more because he was kind of snug still fitting in his old home. So I want to make sure in his new base he'll have plenty of room to spread out. I don't want to set him up for failure. Even though I did say you don't want to trim too much, but I'm not taking off any from the top so he can afford a decent pedicure. Now he's in there and I'll go ahead and sprinkle in and then just a little light pinch of some cocoa core around the base of the tree. Just kind of sprinkle it all the way around. And then I will top him off with the substrate. And I'm sure you can see on camera, but there is a lot of dust to this substrate. So make sure you have your fan on like I do or wear a mask. And then just kind of take your chopstick and kind of go around the circumference of the top of the soil not shoving it down in there but you're kind of wanting to make sure that all this bonsai soil does make it between the root mass and the wall of the pot I always tell you to take time and kind of tamp your soil down you don't really have to do that with this stuff because it really does get in the crevices but you do want to make sure that it is in there securely. And I'm just going to give them another little pinch. Alright. Now the only other thing I have left to do would be to put his little rock friend in there and then water him. Now I won't water him for a day or two just because I watered him really well before this video so that it'd be easier to transplant him. I didn't think I was going to like that pot that he's in. That looks a lot better than what he was looking like. Alright, and as always, I'd like to give a special shout out to my top tier tree patrons like Thien. Thank you. I'd also like to give another shout out to my other patrons like David and Heather. If you were interested in supporting my channel through Patreon, please check the link in the description box below. As always, supporting me through Patreon helps keep the lights on, the water running, all the food for all these beautiful huge hungry plants and to keep me alive and well as well all right guys well this has been justin reminding you that if you can go out and plant a tree let's reforest the world and while you're at it leave me a comment and let me know if you've ever had any kind of success or failures with any other croton family i know i've had mine and don't forget hit the subscribe button or the bell next to it that way you'll know anytime that i've uploaded a new video all right guys take it easy have a good one and don't forget Always plant prudently. Thank you, YouTube.